Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be in the presence of such a, you know, eminent speakers. I myself am not a technologist or a business person. I'm a, I'm a research scientist. And today I want to share with you a technology that's, you know, coming out of fundamental research into physics and how we can actually try and apply some of those concepts into trying to make encryption systems that are quite secure. Um, the title is Unhackable Data with Quantum Key Distribution, and I put the words unhackable in quotes because I want you to think about what it means for something to be unhackable. Now, the key that I'm talking about is an encryption key, okay? And the kind of encryption key I'm going to be talking about is a symmetric encryption key. Imagine you have two parties that we often call Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate securely. And mathematically, the most powerful encryption system that we have is one where Alice and Bob share the same random number. And this random number forms the encryption key. So if Alice, who wants to send a message to Bob, takes his, her random number, adds it to her message, and transmits across to an eavesdropper or to anyone reading the ciphertext, you know, the thing that's been sent across, it will look like just another string of random numbers. Because Bob, on the other side, has the same random number, he can reverse that out. Now, this is uh, a very well-known encryption method. The problem is that it's very cumbersome. How is Alice and Bob going to always share the same random string? So, you know, typically people who are very paranoid and who want to have access to such security, they would, you know, meet together at some point, exchange uh, what we call one-time pads, go away again, and carry out secure communication. This is very different from the most common form of encryption that we use nowadays. Uh, the public key system, right? Because in the public key system, what happens is that we rely on the certain uh, mathematical complexity, or how should I say, the difficulty of uh, reversing a public key and trying to get a private key out of it. The whole point of the public key system, however, is that conventional computing technology it's really difficult to crack. I think our, our first speaker in this session showed some passwords and the time it took to you know, crack uh, long uh, strings. Um, but one of the worries that we have with the public key system is that even to this day, its security is based on assumptions about difficulty of computation. So you know, if we, knew, we knew that if you had more powerful computers in the future, you could crack the public key system. And what happens if someone invents you know, quantum computers, okay? And quantum computers are no longer uh, things that we just have, you know, ideal mathematical models about. People are actually building these devices nowadays. And so, at some point, we have to think about how we're going to move to a new encryption scheme. And we think that quantum key distribution could be one of those solutions. Now, just to set the uh, scene here, the way we want to think about it is that we are getting better and better control over fundamental quantum units, the photon, the atom, the molecule. Over the last 30 to 40 years, rapid advances have been done in laboratories around the world, okay? And now we are able to store information inside these single quantum systems. So we, don't, we call the information that we store in them the quantum bit or the qubit, okay? And it's a very powerful concept because in the conventional data handling systems that we have. We can store a bit in every node. Okay? So for example, you can store a zero or a one. But you had a quantum bit, that node which is storing your information can be in a mixture of zeros and ones. And it's a, it's a coherent mixture that we call a superposition. Okay? And we are getting very really good at storing and transmitting qubits. And in these pictures that you see over here on the left, it's an example of some of the uh, devices that we have in our labs at the National University of Singapore, which is generating uh, photons, uh, generating pairs of photons, actually, and we can store bits of information in them. And on the right is a picture of uh, what we call an atom trap that's storing, let's see here, six atoms in a line. And each of these atoms is capable of storing a qubit, and they can interact with each other and exchange qubits. Now, the superposition properties of these things are actually really interesting because if you can store large numbers of qubits, you can begin to have the basis of a quantum computer. Okay? And the quantum computer, it turns out, is 
you know, not the typical computer that you have, like your laptop, but you should think of it as a specialized piece of hardware, some kind of hardware accelerator that can solve certain specific problems. Simulating you know, generic quantum systems for, for medicine is, is one of those things it's going to be good at. And it turns out that one of the other things that it's good at as well is solving the problem of prime number factorization. Now, prime number factorization is really the basis of why the public key system today is considered to be secure. And if we had a quantum computer that could do prime number factorization very quickly, then we have to worry about the security of our encryption systems. Now, why is quantum key distribution or the quantum encryption method sort of unhackable? Well, it turns out that when we want to carry out quantum key distribution, as we will see in a few minutes, we are going to be transmitting quantum signals. And we're going to be generating the signals based on certain physical processes. And these processes are intrinsically a random process. And because it's intrinsically random, no amount of computing power you have in the world can predict the outcome of the devices. And that's why uh, quantum key distribution is considered to be you know, unhackable from a computational perspective. Okay? And that's where the unhackable uh, in the title comes from. So the quantum signals that we want to use for quantum key distribution are simply sin single particles of light, photons. And with photons, we can transmit them through optical fiber, okay? or we can send the photons through telescopes between buildings or between uh, moving platforms. And we can use this exchange of particles to store, uh, to exchange uh, information. And if you uh, were trying to carry out quantum key distribution between Alice and Bob, or parties who are very far apart, it's very natural to use photons. So what we're going to do in quantum key distribution is encode you know, bits of information into some property of the photon, and typically these properties would be in polarization. So quantum key distribution uh, you know, has certain advantages. First of all, it's immune against computing attacks. The second thing is, if you had these machines installed in place, and as long as Alice and Bob shared a link where the quantum signals could be transferred between them, then they could automate the process of key distribution. And all of a sudden, you, can, you have this way of solving the key distribution problem. They don't have to physically meet each other anymore. So for example, your data centers uh, that you want to you know, secure using quantum key distribution, as long as they are, have optical fiber links, you can actually exchange uh, quantum keys between these data centers. So it's autom automatic. And very interestingly, I think one of the most powerful features of quantum key distribution is the fact that it's tamper-proof. Because we are sending and encoding signals at a single photon level, if there was an eavesdropper who tried to tamper the machine, for example, they would try and split off some of the uh, photons, okay, and try and you know, replace the photon signal, uh, they actually don't know what they're doing because when you have a single photon coming in, you can't actually know its state until you finally measure it. And if Alice had certain predictions on what the state was going to be, then the eavesdropper is just going to mess up the signal and create a lot of noise in the system. So it's sort of tamper-proof, and it can be used to certify the absence of an eavesdropper. Now, the core technology uh, that we want to use in the quantum key distribution system really is the way we are generating the photons and how we're encoding the signals. So in this picture over here, you see what we call a quantum entanglement generator. So what's happening in this picture is that there's a blue light from a laser, say like a, a Blu-ray player, the lasers that you find in your Blu-ray player, and it's going through a, what we call a crystal. And this crystal interacts with the blue light, and sometimes one of the blue photons is split into a pair of lower energy photons that are very strongly correlated. Now, these correlations we call quantum entanglement, and we can actually use them to carry out quantum key distribution, as you'll see in the, the next video that I have. Now, I just want to remind you that quantum key distribution is a, is a wide variety of optical techniques that rely on the properties of the photon. But we believe that quantum entanglement, as we are going to see, is one of the most secure forms of QKD. So how does it work? Imagine that you have this light source that produces a pair of uh, photons at any time. Okay, let's see, it should play. Whoops, go back. 
that. Okay. Oh, it's not playing. We have a technical problem. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh huh. Back. Back. I see the slide on my confidence screen, but it's not playing. Okay, can someone try and play the video? Well, in any case, let me just try and talk over the concept at this point. What you're going to see over here is the fact that in entanglement, you generate a pair of photons that are very strongly correlated. And typically, when we say they're very strongly correlated, what we're trying to do is to try and you know, measure the way the polarization of the photons is encoded in. So in, what happens is that if you have one of the photons that is being created has a polarization pointing in, say, in, in a particular direction, let's say we're pointing up, then we know that its twin photon is always pointing in the same direction. Okay, and no matter how far apart the photons are, are present, they will actually... Ah, the video is playing now. So let me re restart my presentation about here. Okay, so you, you see this um, quantum key generator, which is producing this pace of photons in the stream. And the, the correlations we are looking for is in the polarization of the photons. And you can think of the polarization as one of these arrows that's uh, spinning around. Because they are in this entangled state, the polarization of the photon is not defined. But what we do know is that every time one of them is found to be pointing in the up direction, its twin is always pointing out in the up direction. If it's down, its twin is also in the down direction, and they're very strongly correlated. Okay? And what we do is we measure the outcomes. And then Alice and Bob, who are carrying out quantum key distribution, would then have a, a series of protocols where they compare the measurements, and they find that in the end, they have a string of random numbers that's perfectly correlated. Now, the reason why entanglement is very powerful is that if you had an eavesdropper represented by this red demon here who was interfering with your system, eavesdropping, taking your photons and sampling it, it destroys the quality of the entanglement state. This correlation between the two photons is known as the monogamy of entanglement. The quality of the correlations is highest when there's only two photons or two particles inside the system. If there was an eavesdropper coming in and interfering with the two-party system, now you have you know, a triangle of states. And this lowers the quality of the correlations. And when the correlations are lowered, what you see in the end after you do your exchange and communication, you find that you have quite a large number of errors. Over here, you can see the red uh, numbers that show up the errors. Now, in order to certify the presence or the absence of an eavesdropper, what you do is you calculate your error rate. Okay, and by looking at the error rate, you can make a firm statement of whether the key you have generated is secure or whether you should move on and regenerate the key. So, this is the, this is the concept uh, for carrying out quantum key distribution with entanglement. Okay, let's go move on and back a bit. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, uh, certain advantages of entanglement is that we are relying on intrinsic randomness. And there's also the ability to do third-party operation. If the light source was owned by a third party or even the eavesdropper, because we are using entanglement, there was no way they can mess up with the uh, correlation signals carried by the photon pair. So finally, I just wanted to say that you know, at NUS, we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, this is an example of a complete quantum key distribution system using entangled photons. The photon pay source is this black box you see in the center over here. And what you need to carry out key distribution between the two parties is this uh, laptops and some single photon detectors on either side. Now, if you're really sharp, you have noticed that there's a little white box right in front of the black box. And this is a recent development in our labs where we have taken this big entangled photon source and sque squeezed it down to be quite small and compact and handheld. And so we are really looking forward to this technology getting out of the labs and being tested in the real world. Now, in the future, 
Um, we are hoping that quantum key distribution as an optical technology will be able to span the globe. At the moment, we still have a little bit of a challenge when we are transmitting photons over fibers, there are losses. Okay? And so typically, we can secure uh, an area the size of Singapore very well. But say we wanted to transmit signals between Singapore and say Perth in Australia or in any other city, then it's a bit of a challenge. So there's also lots of work in the world talking about how we carry quantum key distribution systems into satellites. Okay? And if we can actually combine both satellite and, and fiber technology, and we're talking about providing the world with you know, very secure ways of encrypting our data transfers. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, we're going to ask you one question. Who are the possible users of quantum key distribution? Possible users. OK, I think the way we, we often think about quantum key distribution at the moment is that it's something that's used for, the, uh, for transferring large amounts of data on the backbone of the internet. It's not a technology at the moment that we see being uh, ported into your laptops or into your mobile phones. So it'll be something for the, you know, for the internet infrastructure. OK, great. Thank you very much.